our great physician. You are our strength and our redeemer. And we ask your blessings upon all in your holy name. We pray as we celebrate you this day. Amen. Amen. church, whether you're watching later on online or those of you that are here, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, I want to, not that you need to be reminded, but the world needs God's word and uh, we would uh, love for you to bring someone here because they will hear it and live it here. At this time, would you please stand for the entry of the light? Please remain standing for our affirmation of faith. believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the And we will sing verses 1 and 2. God of grace, God of glory.
Heavenly Father, we glorify your name and come together to celebrate what you have done for us as individuals and as a congregation who loves Jesus and chooses to follow him. We come to you grateful for what you have provided and for your holy presence. Hear our hearts individually, Lord, as we open them up to you. We thank you for your word and for a pastor who assures us daily that your wisdom and guidance is available. It is useful to us and it is enlightening. We seek your wisdom, Lord. Your word is life-giving and bold. May we be the same and seek you relentlessly as well as sharing your love with others. Strengthen us to resist the world and help build your kingdom in spite of the enemy. Show us your will for us and where to boldly stand for your truth. May our hearts speak as one as we pray the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the privilege of hearing our choir do their version of Glorify.
going to do that again. Um, in the interest of time, the offering plate today is in the back of the narthex and it is there for your offerings and gifts. And if you see a little black or red on your pew, please register your attendance so we'll know that you're here. And uh, next week you'll know where it is so you can register the people that you bring with you. Uh, at this time, I would um, like to announce our hymn of praise, which is number 620 in your hymnal.
Turn in your hymnals to page 12, the red hymnal. And join with me. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Join with me in our confession and prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against you. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us to joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The marvelous thing about communion is we get to think about it at times in our lives of what really transpired in that upper room. Can you just imagine what it was like being there looking and seeing Christ taking that bread and breaking it? Can you imagine what was going around the table as he broke the bread? And he said to them, this is my body which is broken for many for the remission of sins and the gift of eternal life. And he said, take this and eat as often as you will in remembrance of me. And that's what we're doing this day. We're lifting up this bread as Christ did that night and offering up and say, Father, consecrate and bless this bread that as we partake of it, your Holy Spirit may dwell within us. to smell the aroma. <laughs> he smelled it. Can you imagine it penetrating throughout the whole room as he poured the chalice full and turning and lifting it up and said, Father, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for me. Lift it up and bless it this day as we're doing this pattern. And Father, bless us, and may your spirit fill us with such joy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord's table is open to all. The ushers will leave you. Just come and do it. And fill up around the chancel. Don't be bashful. Don't be like this. You're, you're a good Methodist. So let's rise and come and worship the Lord with the holy meal.
And that's what we do is we come and kneel and partake of this marvelous elements. We surrender all, Lord. We ask your blessings upon us as we rise and leave this place and go out into the world. And may the world know you through us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
dried out out there because right down in here is a leather cup that if it doesn't stay moist it won't build up a vacuum and it won't pull the water up and so you have to prime the pump that's where we are today when we think about it we're here this morning to prime our pump and get us ready for Easter as we move in that direction and thinking along those lines you know we need to be we have to be wet we have to keep our leather cup wet and moist so that we can function and create a, a vacuum that will help us lift up out of our bodies that spirit of the faith that's here. We have a, we have to prime our faith pump. That's why we come on Sunday mornings. We have to renew it and sometimes, I don't know how your week goes, but sometimes my week dries out, is yours? You know, and it just doesn't do what God wants me to do at times. So when we have to do that, we think about our faith will produce a continuous flow of that marvelousness about Christ in our lives. And that's what we're about. We have to have that in our lives. In all we do, in all that we meet, you good people will know what we're about. And we let that flow from our pump of our life with God in that continuous commitment that comes to us from God. He, he never stops. His pump keeps flowing on us and blessing us. And we have to do that. And committing our lives to God. You see, right, here's what he does for us. He's here for us. He's here right now. But he also encourages us. And the marvelous thing is he loves us. And that's important for us in our lives. And he sacrifices the deepest desires for our hearts. He has those. He breaks that into us. Have you ever not have ever taken a moment in our lives to think about the fact being is that and consider asking ourselves that question of what kind of commitment God might expect from us in return for what he's done for us? Yes, he ever wonders about that? You know, there's an old adage that we all know things. When we look at people, we don't really understand them, but we see them. I was watching something the other day of an FBI profiler. <laughs> and uh, she not only was a profiler, but she'd become a professional gambler because she could read and profile the people sitting across the table from her. You realize that God has us all profiled, whether we like it or not. We don't like to talk about profiling because that's sort of a dirty word in our society today. But consider the fact being is God knows our profile. He knows what we're about. And you can fool some of the people all the time. It's an old adage, right? And all the people some of the time. Because what the people... People don't really know us. They only know what they see of us and they see the outside. They don't know what's coming, what's coming from our pump, what's flowing out of us, what kind of water is coming out. 
What kind of spirit is there? However, there are two people that you and I can never fool. Did you know that? One of them is ourself. We can never fool ourselves. We know what we're about. But we can never fool God. God is quite aware of everything in us. Sure, we can put on a good face, and I can have everybody thinking that I'm such a wonderful person, but when I, can, I can't fool myself. And I also can't fool God. I, I can never fool God. God has always been in fact, When I thought I was ahead of things, he was tapping me on the gift on the back of the head and saying, hey, wake up, Bob. You're not what I want you to be. I know what it's like. I've been there. I can remember being in the corporate world and realizing all the people, and I wish at times when I was sitting in the, across a table and negotiating a contract, I could really understand those people that were coming with information back to me. Was it really what they wanted me to do, the truth, or is it what they wanted me to do so that they could get a better contract? I, you know, we've had that kind of life. But see, doing so, you and I can fool some people. But we can never fool ourselves and we can never fool God. That is something, if you get nothing else out of here today, that's the one thing you need to take with us today. And when we think of it, doing so, we can never fool you. And we can't be there. You know, if you and I profess to follow God, and we profess that, then what kind of commitment does God expect from us when we say, here I am, Lord, Use me. You know, we think at times about that. And you know, one that is real is that no one, you know, there is no counterfeit and merely looks good on the outside for being involved in the faith of Jesus Christ. We can do that. Our commitment must be genuine. Our commitment to the Lord must be absolutely authentic. It's important for that in our lives. That's why we're priming the pump. That's why we're putting ourselves ready for what's coming up on Easter Sunday. Our commitment. You know, it's, how many of you watch, did you get to know your tellers in the banks? You ever watch what happens with tellers in the banks, how, they, how they're able to tell counterfeit money from others? They never look at the counterfeit money. They always practice looking at the authentic money. And when it's counterfeit, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And they spot it. You think that doesn't happen? When God looks at us, he does. He knows something about us at times. We think of it. You know, they don't do it. We can get that way in our relationships with God if we continue to prime that pump and let his spirit flow into us that way. We can get that way. We can grow to that very point that we recognize God's true hand in our lives. It's important that we recognize it there. I've seen it at times in mine, and I was wondering about it in yours. You know, there's no need for us to waste our time looking for something else that will satisfy us. Are you with me on that? The greatest satisfaction is, are we doing what God expects of us? And that comes about. You know, commitment involves establishing priorities, though. If you remember in Matthew writing in the sixth chapter of the 13th verse, what did he tell us to do? First, seek the kingdom of God, and then all things will be added. You know, the one thing we must understand as we prime our pump is the fact that we must put God first in our life. That sounds like it's, uh, and it is, it's challenging. It's not easy. I'm gonna be the first to tell you. Making him the foundation on which we build everything in our life on. Can you imagine that foundation? I was look, I was working a crossword puzzle, and it says, where is the tallest building in the world? It's in Dubai, by the way, if you wonder about it. But I was thinking, you ever wonder about, can you, you know, think about Dubai and where it is, but they've got the tallest building in the world. Can you imagine the foundation? Went under. How many of you have been up in the Empire State Building? And you've been all the way to the top. And when you went there, did you ever wonder, What's the foundation of this thing? How is it? It's here. That's what our life is about. It's a foundation that's given to us by God that everything else rests on. You know, it's amazing to think about a, a few ordinary fishermen. Can you imagine if you heard that scripture read 
There was old Peter and Andrew in the boat with their fishing with their nets and doing their things and repairing them. And all of a sudden this fellow walks by and says, come, follow me. I want to make you fishermen of men. And guess what they did? They had to have seen something in that moment that says, okay, we're with you. We're going with you. That's it. And if you read a little further, he did the same thing with James and John and they left their father in the boat and went and followed him. It's a time in our lives when what happens to you and me when we hear God say, come. Well, you know, my story, he told me, I heard him come, say come, and I didn't go for a long time. Moses wasn't the only one in the wilderness for 40 years. But there was coming about that important thing of come. You know, when I think about it, they literally got up out of their boats and left. You know, Matthew and the other gospel writers do not give us I like to see, I like to, it's sort of like reading a book and, and, and trying to read between the lines, right? trying to outdo the author, trying, can you imagine what's happening there as they walked away? What, what transpired? What did they see in Jesus standing there and saying, come, follow me? They, they saw something that we probably can't grasp at this moment, but we try to, that's why we come every Sunday. And they left everything. And can you imagine the risk involved in that? That was their livelihood. And they walked away. So when we hear the invitation from Jesus to come, it must be about the little things as it is about the big thing. It's important for us in our life. You and I have heard stories. We talk about people being afraid to join the church. We have people about being afraid and became their life to Jesus Christ because they said, if I do that, that means I got to get rid of everything I have and sell it off and move and go do something and go to Africa as a missionary. Well, that's not what he said. But there are people that think that way at times and they say, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give up. Did he say that? He just said, come. And if you get coming, then we are going to be like Peter, Andrew, and James, and John. We're going to get involved with it. You know, surrendering to him is one way is not getting rid of everything in our lives, but making everything in our lives follow him. And look, we primed our pump with that spirit that folds out of it. Have you ever felt that, have you been pulled in a quiet time in your life to give more time to God? And then as you're trying to get that, all of a sudden you're looking on your computer and you're getting ready to back away and it says on oh, Paramount Plus, such and such is getting ready to be streamed. And all of a sudden we forget that. Have you ever had that happen to you in your mind? Or in the midst of a prayer, when you're praying to God, and in that quiet moment, all of a sudden we drift away. And we have mind thinkings of other things. You know, we, but we rationalize it away. It's, it's sort of like, uh, how many of you get all of these charitable requests in the mail to give to their charity? One of my favorite ones is Boys Town. Been nine for years. But I get bukus and bukus of others. And at times I say, okay, I'm going to send the money. And I'll open up the envelope and take the little response card out and sit them there. I said, I'll write him a check and I'll mail it to him. A week later, I find he's still lying on my desk. Do you do that? <laughs> at times, what we've done is got busy and our minds moved away from it all. We, we're too busy. Have you ever thought about me uh, giving money to that certain project? Or have you ever considered opening up the Bible to read it and then all of a sudden somebody says something to you or you've had the TV on and something was coming and you forgot? We've all done that. We've been there. What about the other little stuff in our lives? Simply being nice to other people being polite in traffic. That's a guilt I have. Or being encouraging to someone else. Encouraging them, keep them going. I met a young man yesterday, we were visiting a friend who's celebrating her 100th birthday. We were there, and I hope I look as great as Virginia does at 100. She still rides her bike. Even though she has a wheelchair, she still rides her bike. 
And I'm looking at that, and her grandson says to me, do you remember what you said to me some years ago? Because I was their pastor before we came here, and we were their pastor for 14 years. And I remember him having his issues. And he brought it back. He said, do you know what you said to me? And he repeated it to what I said. And I said, well, did it work? And he said, yes, it did. You see, that's the encouragement that we do in life. We don't realize that we're doing that at times. But here, 20 some odd years later, they come, he comes up and says, do you remember this? Well, no. But it's good to hear that I did do some encouragement. That's what we do with the Lord. What brings complete, complete you know, what in our lives competes with God to take control of our lives? There's so much out there, isn't it? When we look at it, things. But you see, God wants to bless us. That's important for us to know. God wants to bless us and to give us the lives of promise and adventure. That's why I write my article every week and call it, and the adventure continues. It is, it's adventure. It's an adventure every day. I don't know how you are, but it's sort of like one of our members handed me a little cartoon the other day, a little girl was getting up on the bed and she was by the window and she says, good morning, Lord. And her father was getting out of bed and looking out his window and he says, good Lord, this morning. <laughs> see, we get that way at times. But we think of the, but you see, God has to know that you and I are serious. That's, I like that word, but. I wrote about, it's a versatile word, right? But is everywhere in the person. But we are. If we prime our pump, that's why we're here. We show him our commitment by carrying out the little things. Not because we like to have to do them, but because we want to do them. It's important for us to be involved in that. You know, Luke wrote about it. Luke gave us in Luke 16, 10. He says, unless you are faithful in small matters, oh, you won't be faithful in large ones. Duh. When we think of that, I want us to remember though, if, we are, if you've ever been in any kind of business, you know how it works. And if you don't take care of the little things in a business, the business will ultimately end up in big trouble. It's the little things that we have to take care of. I think of, there's an old boy that came from Lucas, Arkansas. Do you know what that is? It's over in West Arkansas, between Hot Springs and south of that line to Boonville. His name is Dizzy Dean. Do you remember him? Remember him doing baseball and saying he slowed in the second. He had the fastest, most powerful pitch in baseball in 1930s. They, it was amazing record with how he had blue darter that just absolutely scorched the batter in the wind block. Playing an all-star game in 1937, he was around, he had a ball, it was going out toward the fence, and Dizzy, instead of running the bases, was watching the ball where it was going, and he tripped on the base, on the back. Stuffed his toe extremely bad. And then what happens is, he goes back to pitch and he gets up on the mound and when he starts to pitch, his stub toe hurts him. So he changes his delivery. Dizzy Dean said later, the stub toe shortened my career because it was a little thing that I tried to correct and it didn't work. Put him out of business. The little thing in our life. So we're like Dizzy Dean. It's those little things that we have got to watch. We have to focus on them in our lives. And how could making God our top priority change our circumstances? I ask that question. I ask it of myself. How? In order to make a true commitment to God, we must also be willing to sacrifice something. We have to give up something. You all know I've been on a trying to fight diets for a long time, right? What do you have to give up in diets? You have to give up something, right? 
You have to push away from that table. You have to take half as much as you normally take. You have to give up. You have to move away. And that's what God is saying to us. It's a little thing. Often this means uh, choosing to please God rather than choosing to please other people. Ever been there? When you realize it. I had, we have a son-in-law that was many years in his life. He had one rule with his children. It's the do right rule. And his whole thing was, and he says, what do I do? And he says, do right. And that's what God says to you and me, do right. You know what's important for us? If we get this right, it will actually save us a lot of trouble in our lives. Since you and I can never please everyone. We try it, right? All the time, anyway. When we try to please everyone, that loses us. We, that's the quickest way to go to failure. You can't do that in this world. You can lose your own sense of what is right and what is not right when we're trying to do it. And trying to agree what other people say is important. You heard that old story about the father and his son with his donkey walking down the road and they're walking along by themselves and they have the donkey on the, on the reins of the donkey and they're walking and somebody walks by and says, well, isn't that old man something? He's walking there making his son walk when he could ride on the donkey. So they pick him up and put a boy on the donkey and they're walking on down. See how things we try to please people? And he walked over on that and somebody comes by and says, look at that kid. There he is, up on the donkey, and his daddy is having to walk. So they said, okay. So they took the boy down and put the dad up on the donkey, and they walked away. Guess what happened? The next group come by and says, look at that old man. He's won't let the kid lead him, and he rides the donkey. So guess what they did? They took that, both of them got off. They took up a pole. They tied the feet of the donkey onto the pole, and they carried the donkey. <laughs> They were crossing the bridge, and the bridge collapsed, and the man, the man and his son and the donkey fell into the river. You see, what we do, it's a little thing. We try to please people, and yet it isn't important. The pleasing is pleasing God. That's important. And if we please God, guess what we're going to do? We're going to automatically be pleasing to the whole world. We're not going to become horses, rear ends on all of it. We're going to do it. Commitment involves us in making a choice of what we're going to believe and who are we going to serve. That's the commitment that we have. That's priming the pump that we are in this Lenten season of hinting to do as we get there. And I got to thinking, you remember what it said? The Bible says to you and me, you and I can't serve two masters. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, you will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. It's not easy, is it? On a scale of one to 10, how committed are you and I to seeing God as master of our lives? Scale of one to 10. And as we live in today's world, we must ask ourselves, whom do I serve? Who is master of my life? You know, you and I can quickly answer when we take a look at where we spend most of our time and our energy. That's where we put our energy. That's what's controlling our life. Often, it's not an easy decision at times. I know, I've been there. Because we can make, you know, we, we may feel as if we are like those men that were, remember the old guy on TV that used to keep his plates on the top of the pole, stirring the plates, trying to keep them all going. He's going from one to the other. We feel like we're in the middle of that. We feel like we're balancing the plates. We're in the between lives and we're trying to do that. It's a balancing act that we want. God doesn't want us in that. We need to prime the pump in between other people's expectations of us and our expectations of ourselves, what we believe is expected us to do. That's what God says. What we believe expects of us. That's what it is. 
What's it expected that you believe in today? What is expected of us in that belief? And when the pump is pouring forth with that cool, sweet, clear water from God's help in our lives, you know, we learn to put God first. And when pumping from his well, you and I get to know his ways and knowing that we can move clearly between the things that are truly important and lasting in our lives and those that are not. We have no issues there. Everything is not, can be easy once we decide to fully commit to God. It's, it's in, it's, with his help, we're able to go through that in our commitment. You see, we think that if we got there, it was going to be easy. It doesn't work that way. It has to happen. We're promised in Psalms 34, 17, that the Lord will deliver us from our troubles. Pretty much a guarantee that we will have troubles, right? If the Lord is going to relieve us of them, then we're going to have them. But remember, when the ground we stand on is one of faith and a commitment to God, you and I can be assured that God has a plan for our life. Even at our age, we think about it, all right? I was, as I was visiting with Virginia yesterday, and she was celebrating her 100th birthday. I asked her what she was doing. She was telling me what she's going to do next week. You see, that's important. That's what we do in our lives. God says you're never too old. We've been studying Moses, right? We know the 40-year sections of his life, and now we're doing with that very end as he's crossing over, or at least he isn't, but the Israelites are crossing over to the Promised Land. We've been, you realize what's gone through Moses' life? It's gone through ours. Know this, though. Our hope in God is our future. God is love. You've all realized that, right? And I love what a layman who was a big layman in the church for years, Harry Dinkin, said, God is love. Not a cheap, sentimental love, but a redeeming love which cannot be said, but must be seen in the way we live. Is your pump proud? I pray it is. And what water of faith is flowing from our pump? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing number 571, the Lake of all disciples. Now we know that Jesus is the only one that takes a disciple out of us. But he wants us to give that call to everyone. We're going to sing verses 1 and 4. <laughs>
turn to all those around you as you leave and say what? I love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you in your rising up and in your lying down, in your going out and in your coming in, in each day in your life. Until all of us stand before Christ in that day when there is no sunset and no dawning. And Harry is welcome to us all. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't be bashful.